um, our next speaker is Emilio Calvano, uh, professor of economics at University of Rome, Tor Vergata, associate faculty at Toulouse School of Economics and research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. Uh, Emilio is an applied theoretical economist whose research focuses on the theory of industrial organization published in uh, outlets such as Science Magazine, American Economic Review, Management Science, American Economic Journal, Microeconomics Journal, and the International Journal of Industrial Organization. And he's an associate editor, well, that's a lot of work, at the uh, Journal of Industrial Economics. So the talk we're gonna hear, artificial intelligence, algorithmic pricing, and collusion, I've listened to Emilio talk about this, this is a total knockout and is going to really uh, make, you, make you ask yourself what's going on next time you engage uh, with some of these pricing algorithms. They uh, may not be working exactly like you think. So Emilio, please come and uh, join us. Tell us about it. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so it's a privilege to be here. Um, it's a fantastic uh, conference. It's an incredible location. I feel like a superstar now. And uh, thanks for the, for the too generous introduction. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking basically about AI uh, in a particular, particular context. So I'll tell you the fun that we had uh, running an experiment. And um, so this is a, a line of research that's been going on for a um, few years now. Uh, but before doing that, I know that, that this is a very uh, diverse crowd, you know, uh, super technical and, and, and coming from different backgrounds. And, you know, I just wanted to, you know, um, tell you not what is AI, that's way too ambitious, but what I think uh, when, I, when, I, when I think about AI. Um, um, let's start with just, um, uh, just to set the stage, okay? So let's start with some definitions. Um, you know, a practical one would be that uh, artificial intelligence is something that is able to ingest, I'm just skipping here, able to ingest human knowledge and then uses information to automate and accelerate tasks that were previously performed by humans. Um, computer science thinks of it uh, in a more sophisticated way. You know, it could be devices that perceive the environment in, you know, like you know, this can be precise, and um, you know they sort of try to achieve a goal. Um, and of course, I mean, you know, a practical one would be we could think of AI as something that it's able to do cognitive work. Okay, but uh, you know, I have a much more humble, simple, basic definition of AI, um, um, which reflects a particular view in the academic literature. So typically, when we study AI, at least from what I've seen, um, we think about statistical tools, okay, that make predictions and then make decisions based on those predictions. This is a narrow view of AI. We think about automation and we think about, you know, in more of a philosophical sense, um, being superhuman, whatever that means. I don't think that that exists. And so, you know, you know, I know you're excited about AI, but here it's really going to be uh, boring statistical models that are trying to predict uh, something, okay? So for me, the boring uh, definition, but the right one, at least for the sake of this talk, would be uh, let's think about solutions or software tools, if you want, that you know, are useful to, cheap, um, to crack, sorry, in a cheap way, dynamic decision problems under uncertainty. And that explains also why an economist is interested in them. So to me, AI, it's basically about, you know, making choices and predicting the consequences going forward of those choices, okay? So this could be uh, applied to a variety of market settings. So I'm an industrial organization economist, so I study markets and their functioning. So these are just a few applications that, you know, have been studied. Um, so online advertising, is powered by machine learning, of course. I mean, the ads, the personalized ads that you see online are chosen using contextual bandits. The editorial choices, you know, the recommended articles in your New York Times app are, you know, selected for you by an algorithm which is trying to predict your tastes. Um, firms use these algos to match you to products. So, you know, the, your Amazon search results 
your Amazon web page, the home page, everything is customized in a way that makes it easier for you to find goods and services that they think you need. Um, they're used to price goods and services. You, you know, prices are set by machines. Sometimes they're personalized by machines. Uh, you know, sometimes they change in dynamic in a dynamic way because there's been a prediction that you know demand and supply need to rebalance in the near future. That's what Uber uses. Uh, and of course, you know, there are all the financial applications. We, I guess, you all heard about you know robot advising, you know, financial advice, personalized banking algorithmic trading and bidding and so on, okay? So the idea is, you know, the, the sort of overarching theme of, you know, people interested in studying these tools is we've seen uh, the deployment of these tools in actual marketplaces, but we don't, un before, because we don't fully understand how they work, we don't know what this is doing to our markets. Possibly this is kind of removing frictions and making our markets work better, or possibly not, okay? And so the idea is if we don't know the answer to that question, then we should have you know, broad research agendas that try to tackle that question, right? Try to study what's the effect on you know, portfolio of having you know, more algorithmic uh, advice than we had before and so on and so forth, okay? Or you know, markets more general. Okay, so what makes uh, artificial intelligence different than other forms of software aided decision making or rule based decision making is that typically these tools, they're model free. Okay, so they typically learn autonomously how uh, to crack a problem by trying things out. And they're also increasingly available off the shelf. Okay, what this means, you know, think about a programmer of an AI pro program. So typically uh, you have to specify what the objective is, what the goal is. You have to specify what contexts, you know, is the machine going to be able to monitor, what's going to observe if you want, what's what, what it can react to. And then, you know, um, that's it. Right, then the, the machine is going to do the job. And then the question is, let's think of it for a second from a legal perspective. If I instruct a computer to do maximize my profits, my revenues, and you know, my computer ends up wrongdoing in some sense, am I liable or not? Right, so do we need to update our liability standards? It's not written in the code. So, you know, I, wasn't, I didn't have an intention to do harm, but you know, harm happened. And so what do we do about it? So this makes it also kind of trickier from a legal standpoint in the sense that, you know, there is, you know maybe we should update our legal doctrine to reflect the fact that these tools are very different than the software tools that we've been using since the 80s. Okay, so, um, so let me switch to the particular application. So here we're really moving to the retail market. So I want you to have in mind Amazon. If you want an example in your head, amazon.com. The idea is firms, retailers, uh, manufacturers are increasingly adopting pricing algorithms, okay? So there is already systematic evidence that that's happening on say amazon.com or you know, any other big online retailer. Um, now, the, this is not a surprise because, you know, all these intermediaries, they think that automation is a source of value. You know, if you automate more, that's better. And so they even encourage it. Okay, so they would, Amazon, for instance, they have an API that basically allows me as a seller to, the, you know, to create some computer code that is able to tap into the Amazon database, retrieve information about my competitors and change my offerings in real time in an automated fashion. Okay, so they even assist you uh, to achieve the highest level of automation because again, they think you know, that sellers that get this sort of service, they will be more willing to join the Amazon ecosystem and that's, and that's of course um, a big plus for them. Okay, so my sort of starting point is that this kind of uh, automated pricing, AI pricing, it's here to stay. If you want to, you know, just if you're curious, you just Google repricing software and you'll discover that there, there is an entire industry which is developing those software solution. So they work a little bit like this, it's very simple. You know, you click on one of those links and they will tell you, oh, wow, we're gonna use our AI game theory magic 
to maximize your revenues, you pay 45 bucks per month, and then you give us uh, your eBay, your booking.com, your Amazon credentials, and then we'll take over, we'll start pricing those goods for you. So that's literally how they work. Another nice sort of fact to motivate uh, what I'm gonna show you is that there is also evidence that these algorithms are spilling from the online world to the offline world. So this is a famous case of gas retailing in Germany and Denmark that uh, adopted um, a particular AI powered software to set the price at the pump. So the price at the pump will change in real time depending on the weather, on traffic conditions, and of course, depending on the price that was charged by the rival down the road. The reason why this was possible in Denmark and Germany is because the government decided at some point to increase price transparency. So they created basically uh, data silos and everyone had to constantly update all their prices to this uh, facility. But then, of course, the downside is that then everyone could monitor everybody else's prices in real time. So, you know, this allowed this kind of software to also react in real time to whatever the competitors were doing, okay? And there is evidence, um, there is a nice paper by a couple of German guys that this led to increase of prices at the pump, okay? So this brings you to my question. So here the idea is, okay, so if more and more of those prices are automated, then is this gonna increase the prices that we pay for services or maybe not? Is this gonna increase the extent of competition that we have those marketplaces? The most interesting question, you know, the, whether prices go up or down, it's important, okay? But um, from a legal standpoint, the most interesting question is why? they all go up or down. So do they go up because the machines are not learning to compete? Okay, again, so competing in a marketplace, it's a pretty sophisticated task. And you might think that, you know, machine failing to learn to compete might lead to higher prices. Okay, let me give you a basic example. If, you know, I'm picking a random price from an interval, okay? and the floor of that interval is my marginal cost. And if my rival is doing the same, we're not competing, but we're, we're making profits, okay? So picking a random price is literally the dumbest thing that you could do. Yet, if we're both doing a dumb thing, we're gonna end up with higher prices and higher profits, right? That does not make sense because if I know that my rival is dumb, then I should take advantage of him, right? So I should try to best respond to whatever he's doing. And that means that, you know, uh, this, you know, we shouldn't expect uh, well-functioning markets to implement these kind of outcomes. And then, of course, the question is, is AI inducing high prices because it's dumb, or is AI inducing high prices because it's actually pretty sophisticated in the sense that they figured out a way to coordinate those prices, like a scheme that in the antitrust literature is called uh, collusion, okay, a cartel, that allows to sustain those high prices as an equilibrium outcome of a particular uh, um, market interaction, okay? Now, if they're sophisticated to that level, then that's gonna ignite uh, a big debate. And, you know, if they're more sophisticated than humans, then, you know, what do we do about it, right? And that's, you know, I've been also working on that front, trying to inform uh, the policy debate um, about what to do. Okay, so there is a huge um, policy debate around, around this uh, debate on AI pricing and collusion. Uh, all antitrust authorities have been wondering, you know, if that's going on or not. All antitrust authorities have been wondering if more algorithms in our markets is a good or a bad development. And let me tell you that also all central banks, of course, have been wondering if more AI in uh, financial markets as a good or a bad development, okay? So you could, you know, if you want, maybe you could talk about this later, but you could translate some of the insights of this research to, you know, similar strategic settings in financial markets, okay? Um, right, um, they, they, even in you know, the United States, um, we went to present this at the FTC. Um, um, so when we started this, we said, why don't we try and contribute this by, by modeling AI? Now, from a methodological point of view, um, getting theoretical results is very difficult because 
artificial intelligence is not particularly sophisticated at all. I mean, the algorithms are very simple. The, you know, it's kind of a dumb intelligence from a theoretical uh, perspective, but it, it gives rise to very complex dynamical systems that are just intractable to analyze. Okay, so if, you know, if I wanted to say what would be the sort of long-term outcome of the repeated interaction between two simple dumb AI algorithm, that would mean cracking a very hard um, system of difference equations, and it's just too hard. So the way we decided to tackle this problem is, okay, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to code some of these algorithms and we're going to test them in sandboxes. So we're going to simulate a marketplace interaction. The algorithms are, you know, they wouldn't know if that's a real or unreal marketplace. They're just going to behave as if it is and see what happens then, right? So that's the approach we're going to follow you. So let me, let me summarize, you know, just to make sure that, uh, you know, it's, we're all on the same page about what we do. We're actually going to code two or more independent AI pricing agents. I'll describe them later on. Then we're going to let them compete in a simulated marketplace. Okay, so they're going to be playing against each other, trying to sell goods, okay, to a synthetic demand, synthetic set of consumers. We're going to trade them we're going to train them but letting them play against clones of themselves and the idea is to document the strategies they learn i really want to learn like at the end of this training process what's their strategy what how do they react to the environment in which way can i document the sort of schemes that i was talking about now you know clearly there are some external validity challenges here right so we are you using, you know, are you really capable of simulating um, a market interaction in, in a way that it's actually teaching us something about the real world? So we, we're aware of that. I actually have two projects that are trying to replicate this on Amazon.com, okay, so trying to do this on the real marketplace. But, you know, the main result is, you know, I'm going to show you that at least in this context, the AI becomes pretty sophisticated in the sense that they actually manage to learn to play sophisticated strategies in, in this kind of rich environments without communicating with one another. Okay, so they're not talking with one another. Yes, Lisa. Right. Oh, I didn't know that about that particular experiment. I'm talking to those guys at DeepMind who developed AlphaGo. The architecture is not the same in the sense that AlphaGo it's very it's much more sophisticated than what we have here, but the building block is the same. So we're going to use the same class of algorithms. So AlphaGo is um, Alpha Zero, the latest iteration. It's an algorithm that has been shown to teach itself from scratch how to play chess in a superhuman way. Okay, better than, than professional chess players. And um, yeah, so one way of thinking about this paper is, so the DeepMind guys, they test whether you can train an AI algorithm to beat the world champion of chess. Here we test whether this kind of AI algorithm can teach themselves to jack up prices in marketplaces. But you know, the philosophy, if you want, it's, it's the same and the underlying basic architecture is also the same. Okay. Actually, I was talking with these AlphaGo guys because my algos are not communicating. And so one possibility, one, one interesting thing to see is if you embed some communication possibilities, if you allow the algo to talk to each other, you know, is that going to make it easier for them to crack uh, the, the coordination problem or not? So question on some of the agents. It sounds like some of them were neural networks. Did you have any of them that were like Bayesian inference or some other like other statistical, like more classical um, algorithms that you mixed in? Oh, just curious, what was the composition of the agents? Yeah, so I'm gonna tell you what we, so here, this is gonna be basic tabular Q learning, so not neural network, but this exercise has been replicated with deep learning. So kind of scaling up the, and surprisingly, you know, you know, even with a basic tabular algorithm, this, you know, sort of uh, does the trick. Okay, I, I'm just gonna keep um, talking about other papers. And again, it's kind of a 
ambitious talk just because I have to tell you many things. So I have to describe the algorithms. I have to tell you the economic environment, what the economic environment is, which is the game, what they've been playing. And then I'm going to be um, spending some time on the results. And if time permits, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the policy debate around um, this um, algorithmic collusion issue. Okay. Now, the um, conceptual framework is very simple. It's that of a basic reinforcement learning uh, problem, which I think you know, many, many of you are familiar with. But the idea is, is that you have an agent okay, that has to make a sequence of, of decisions, or sorry, facing a sequence of choice problems. And then this agent is going to be, let me close this microphone, otherwise you're going to hear me twice. Okay, so this agent, before, ma before making each and every one of these choices, is going to be observe something about the environment that it's relevant for that choice. And then, of course, it's going to be shaping the environment while making those choices. And it's going to getting, you know, it's going to be getting a stream of rewards. Okay, what a reinforcement learning algorithm does is that in every period, it's going to either exploit the information is already acquired with, you know, in the past, or try something else new. And um, like in that way, it's going to be able to learn uh, from experience. Okay, so you know, conceptually, the idea is very simple. Things that work in the past that worked in the past are going to be reinforced, and vice versa. Okay, so it's going to try things out and reinforce things that worked in the past. The theoretical framework it's going to be that of a standard um, MDP. Um, so again, this is very simple. The idea is that you know you have a, a, a set of uh, periods of time steps, possibly infinitely many of them. There's going to be a state space which summarizes the world around the agent. There's going to be an action set, which is the level that the you know, agent can pull at every point in time. Um, the a scalar reward. And then there's going to be a function which summarizes the world, Okay, which is going to tell you, tell me what action you took in which particular state of the world. And I'll tell you what is the distribution over future states and rewards and current rewards. The agents are going to be impatient, so they, they prefer earlier reward to a later reward, so they're going to be discounting the future. And then they're just going to be choosing a policy. So the goal of this algorithm is to figure out what is the best action in every possible state. Okay, what, what, How do I define the best action? You know, I'm trying to maximize the present value of the stream of rewards. Okay, So in chess, the idea is that I'm trying to maximize my chances of winning the game. Does that make sense? All right. Um, so the, if you want, uh, the, the a key um, um, object okay, in this theoretical framework is what is called the Q value. So the idea is um, I want to know in every possible state what is the value going forward of taking every possible action. Okay, the true value going forward of taking every possible action. If I know the true value going forward of taking um, every possible action, then my choice problem is very simple. Like in each state, I take the action to which is associated the highest value going forward. Okay, so in a chess application, again, the Q is going to be the probability of winning. You know, what's the probability of winning if with this particular board, that's the state, I'm just going to move. Uh, make this move. What's the probability of winning if instead I'm going to make this other move and so on and so forth. And the idea is that whoever, you know, if you're trying to maximize your chances to win the game, you're going to be choosing the action that uh, has the highest uh, implied pro estimated probability. Okay. Now, you know, one simple way of thinking about reinforcement learning, it's really as an estimator. So you have this dynamic decision problem. You have to estimate these values. And this RL is simply a bootstrapping procedure to estimate uh, these values. And that's it. Okay, So um, you make some observations, you update your estimates, and you go on. All right, so um, these algorithm uh, uh, which is called Q-learning, um, will have to be initialized. So what are those values at the beginning? That's up to me. I could you know, just set those values at random, uh, or I could set them at zero. So you, know, you, you could play with this. Or you could inject some knowledge about the problem by playing with this, with this value. Then in each subsequent period, okay, I'm just going to 
update those values. And here I'm going to tell you how do I update those values, okay? So with some probability, I'm going to um, choose a random action. And with some probability, I'm going to choose the action to which is associated the highest Q value from the previous period, okay? Then I'm going to observe the reward and the next state, and then I'm going to update those estimates, okay? So what I have to describe to you is just the learning equation. That's the core, if you want, of the algorithm, and then I'm done. So the learning equation is this one. So the new value going forward of taking one action in a particular state is going to be a convex combination of what I knew and what I learned. And what I learned depends on the reward that I got, right? Because it's what I observed, and also on the next state, okay? Because my payoff is going to be, you know, this plus delta, the continuation value, right? So that's it. I mean, it, when I was saying that in you know the tabular Q learning, it's a simple algorithm. This, this is it. And so the idea is, if you iterate this, you're going to be able to crack any Markov decision process that you know that has some nice properties. So that's the claim. Okay. Um, what, what for that probability that could be fixed or that could be decreasing. I mean, you want this exploration to fade out over time you know, to be able to learn anything. So these are algorithms which explore a lot at the beginning, and then as time passes, they keep exploiting the information more and exploring less until, you know, exploration dies out and goes to zero. Okay, so again, this is um, the reason why we chose this particular algorithm is that, you know, it's, it's not fancy, it's simple, it's model-free, it works, it's popular as we discussed, and, you know, so it's a successful in many, games you know it's been proven successful in many games of strategy okay mm -hmm. such as competing all right so unless you guys have questions about the uh inner workings i'll just proceed and i'll tell you you know what is the game that they're playing i'll talk you about the application so i'm going to describe to you what the state space is what the action set is and then i'm going to move on to the results Okay, so this is going to be an oligopoly interaction. So think about a marketplace with two firms in the simplest you know, possible case. So these two firms are selling differentiated goods, and there's going to be a demand for these goods. Okay, this is a flexible way of representing demand, this one. It, it has many parameters which allow you to play with you know how substitutable those goods are you know the, their vertical quality you know the horizontal preferences you can play um, with the outside option and so on so this is just a flexible way of representing an oligopoly interaction so this is the reward function so i'm going to feed the algorithm with the profit that they would get when player i is going to choose by i and player j is going to choose price by j. Does that make sense? Okay. Cool. So two independent algorithms setting prices repeatedly and then the profits that they get are represented by this function here which is a flexible way of representing a standard market interaction. Okay. In principle, you know, I could go on Amazon, take one market, estimate these parameters and then in that case, I would be applying them to this particular marketplace, to this particular object, okay? So we can play with that. Cool. Now, how do you implement what you showed us? Okay, so in this particular exercise, they can choose, you know, the action set is one of 15 price points, so they could choose one of 15 prices, and these prices can be very low or very high, so above the jointly maximizing prices, so above the price that we would set if we were to perfectly collude or coordinate our choices and below the prices that we would set if we were to compete, okay? The state space is going to be yesterday's prices. I think you know, that's a natural thing. In a market environment, you react to your rival price, right? So you, you say, what's my rival price yesterday? And I react to that. Does that make sense? And then the reward is gonna be profit. So with this, I basically told you how I'm gonna apply that simple theoretical framework to this particular market interaction. So 15 actions, the state is gonna be the rival price, yesterday's prices, and the reward is gonna be profits. Okay. 
Cool. So just notice that, you know, again, this is very simple. These algorithms, they're not observing very much, okay? In, you know, if, if this were a, a, a chess problem, they would be observing the board, okay, the position of every piece. If this were, you know, a, a self-driving car, they would be observing their surrounding, okay? So the state space would be literally a picture of the surrounding and all those other sensor inputs. So here, the input is just a pair of prices, okay? So they're just observing what was charging, what was my rival charging yesterday, and they're mapping that to a current price. So it's, again, it's very simple. Um, so that is it, it can count a volume for the sales volume. So raise the price, rapid would go up, except all the volume goes to your competitor. Right, exactly, through the reward, okay? So if you raise the price and you're below the profit maximizing prices, then it's correct. So you're gonna be possibly uh, reduce the volume, but increase revenues. And that's gonna mean a higher uh, reward. So you're gonna be making more money, as, as simple as that, yeah. So they're gonna be observing that, you know, given what my rival is doing, if I increase my price, more money is coming in. And so, you know, ideally they're gonna reinforce that. So again, at some point, the rival well, but if your rival reacts, okay, maybe it's changing its price, maybe reducing its price and stealing away business from me, then if I keep charging that price, the reward associated to that price is going to be lower and then I will reinforce something else. I will start trying, you know, a different price to see if it works best, right? So that's, and this is what makes this particular application um, uh, hard on these algorithms, because algor these algorithms are designed to crack um, MDPs, okay, which are stationary, pro stationary MDPs. So, or if you want, another way of putting this is that there are theoretical guarantees that these algorithms can crack stationary MDPs. So here, the problem is, because there is a strategic component, this is a game, it's not, it's not a decision problem. Um, one way of putting this is, you know, things that worked yesterday might not work anymore today because my rival is doing something else, right? Because my rival changed the strategy, okay? Which means that, you know, the best thing to do is going to depend to whatever my rival is doing and vice versa. Okay, so these algorithms might start looping. So I start doing something, you best react to that something, and then I best react to that something, and so this loop kind of never ends, and then we never actually converge to an equilibrium. Okay, so this is, so um, technically, because of this, uh, there are no theoretical guarantees that this, that this could work if, you know, um, following the logic, your logic, yes. I make a decision based on whatever I observe, okay? So just to make this concrete, if you're on Amazon, the idea is you query Amazon and you say, Amad, hey, Amazon, what's the price of my rivals? You observe that and you immediately react. That's how it actually works, okay? So you can only hop to react to your rivals current prices, but, you know, that doesn't mean that you cannot indirectly react to your rival's future prices, okay? So say, suppose that, you know, I know that my rival is lowering its, its price every minute or so, then I know that if yesterday's price, you know, if the current price is $1 and the price goes down by one cent every minute, I know that his next price in one minute would be 99, and maybe I will set 98 now and jump the gun. So I know his next move, I know his current price, that tells me something about his next move, and then I just jump the gun. So if I, if I keep doing that, then my rival is never selling because I'm always one cent cheaper than my rival, you see? So reacting to the past doesn't mean that you're not forward-looking, okay? You can be forward-looking indirectly, right? Right. 
Yeah, no, that, that, this is just a simplification. So we start with one, so we do two, three, then it becomes computationally intractable. And then what you have to do is to deploy a neural net. Because the idea is that these algorithms, they learn by observing what happens in every possible circumstance, okay? But the idea, at least, you know, one of the ideas behind neural networks is that if something is good in one particular situation, it's going to be approximately good in a perturbation of that particular situation. Right? Does that make sense? Right? If driving in one direction is safe and I perturb the environment, so I move a little bit, you know, a pedestrian, that's going to not change the fact that driving in that direction is going to be safe. That means that I do not, you know, to learn how to drive safe, I do not have to observe every possible pedestrian position. I can extrapolate. And so if you want to sort of go in that direction, then this is the wrong tool. Because, you know, here we're literally sweeping the state space many, many times. Right. Cool. Um, right. Um, Okay, um, right, I think we talked about how challenging uh, this is, and of course, I guess, you, know, you believe me, that you can make this more complicated, right? You can always make things more complicated and see if they work, so that's what they do. So the idea is now, I'll describe you what the experimental protocol is, so the experiments that we run, and then, and then I'll tell you what, what results we get, okay? So these algorithms, they do have parameters, hyperparameters that we, the designers, should set. So the question is, Emilio, how do you design your algorithms? Maybe you're cherry picking, you know, you're showing us, you know, the only constellations that actually work. And so to, you know, basically what we do, we sweep um, the um, parameter space. So we look at a grid, which means we look at a grid of possible algorithmic design, okay? So that means that we run uh, lots of experiments, okay, for every possible um, choice of those hyperparameters that govern these algorithms, we make an experiment. And then, um, you know, we set these parameters in a range which makes it reasonable. Uh, they're going to be playing for billions of iterations, up to one billion in this particular case. So again, choosing for up to one billion uh, prices. Um, and then we're going to do 1,000 sessions for each parameterization. So for each parameterization, we're going to run 100 experiments. Think of it as 100 parallel universes in which the algorithm starts. They interact with themselves. They learn something. And then, um, and then we look at what they learn. Okay? So I'm going to report the averages across the sessions and experiments. Now, you know, if you got lost, at some point, um, you know, there is a simple way of thinking about these experiments. So the idea is think about two agents starting with random strategies. So again, a strategy is a mapping from yesterday's price, the last price, the last market prices to today's price. So think about agents starting literally doing random things. Then the strategies are going to jointly evolve according to some algorithm then or dynamical process then you know we let these strategies evolve and when they stop evolving we call it a day and we say okay so let's see uh what the strategies look like and so the goal for me is literally to describe to you how they behave you know what is the map from prices from previous prices to current price does that make sense? So the first thing that I would do is um, to show you, well, first of all, you know, it works in the sense that they do stop evolving. So the point of this slide is just that. So eventually, those strategies, they, they reach um, a resting point. So they stop moving around. And so we can actually look at what happened. That happens always, always. It's not guaranteed. That's why that's the result. The second thing that we do is, okay, now we know how they behave. We want to test if they behave in a quote-unquote smart way. What does it mean for an algorithm to behave in a smart way? Well, it means that it's playing an equilibrium strategy, okay? So the question is, are these algorithms best responding to what their rival is doing, okay? So what we do, we test for equilibrium. And so what we find is that indeed they learn to react optimally to whatever their rival is, is doing, okay? React optimally to their strategy. 
which is a sign that what we're analyzing, it's actually equilibrium behavior and not some malfunctioning of this evolutionary, uh, evolutionary path. Okay, so also what it means, if you're best reacting, if you're best reacting to your rival, you cannot be exploited, right? So the, nobody can exploit you. So this is you know, kind of going in the direction that, you know, what we're, what we're observing is something um, clever and not dumb. So this is looking at um, outcomes, okay? Not strategies, but outcomes, you know? How do, if you want those prices look like? So this is doing this in profit space, okay? Let me first define this measure for you, which we call the profit gain. So it's two firms, okay? On one hand, you can compute, right? What would be the maximum profit that they could achieve if they were to perfectly coordinate their prices, or if you want, Think about these two firms merging and having the same market in direction, choosing both prices, okay? That's the best possible scenario, okay? That's delta equal to one. Delta equal to zero is the competitive outcome, okay? What's the profit that they would get if they were competing, okay? Anything in between means that they're making more profits than they should, if you want if they were competing. So this is showing you those profits, okay, um, for as a function of the design. So every little square here is like a, a, a design of those algorithms, okay? So these are those hyperparameters that I was talking about. And so what this shows, I mean, if you want the message from this is that there is cooperation across the board in the sense that you're getting much higher profits that they would get uh, if they were to compete. And if you were to cherry pick the design, you would find that they actually learn to extract the full monopoly rents in this market, okay? Now this is showing the same, this is trying to make the same point in price space. So here I'm taking one of these squares, okay, one design, and I'm showing you prices, okay? Now price of firm one and price of firm two, now here M is that price vector that maximizes the industry profit, okay? So if we were to merge, we should definitely choose this. And B is the price vector corresponding to the equilibrium outcome if they're competing. And this is just the distribution of those prices across all those thousand sessions, okay? So again, they don't nail it perfectly, right? So they don't always learn to pick the exact uh, profit max industry profit maximizing price, but you see these prices are much closer to uh, the monopoly price than to the duopoly prices, okay? So again, I'm trying to make the point that, you know, th these algorithms, you know, they evolve in a way that, you know, increases the price level. That's it. It's not, it's not more sophisticated than that. Right, so again, are they doing this because they're dumb? As I told you, if you choose a random price above cost and your rival does the same, you get something like this. I mean, right? You get something above that for sure, right? So are they failing to learn to compete or are they actually learning to collude? Now, what does it mean to collude? In the law and economics literature and in you know, the antitrust doctrine around cartels, there is like a consensus over one particular definition of, of, of one specific definition of collusion, which is basically a reward punishment scheme. Okay, so the idea is that two firms are colluding if they're choosing high prices because they fear that if they were to do something else, there would be retaliation, okay? Right, so this kind of reward punishment schemes, which could be implicit or explicit, Okay, so think about executives of big firms, you know, sitting around the table and deciding that, you know, this is going to be the price of our product. And if any of you tries to charge anything else, we're going to revert to this much lower price. Okay? These reward punishment schemes allow you to support high prices because every individual firm is going to be incentivized by the threat of getting punished if, you know, they decide to take advantage of their rivals and lower their prices. Another way of saying this is that the market price, a market price is a public good, okay? So if we're all industry participants, 
basically, you know, we all collectively want to keep those prices high, but conditional on you guys making the effort of keeping prices high, I want to take advantage of it and sell more. And of course, if I try to take advantage of it, that's gonna you know, erode the public good and the prices will come down, right? So here we just wanna test if indeed those prices are high because the algorithms fear the retaliation of the arrival. Okay, so how do I show you? Well, this is like a nice experiment that, that nicely makes the point. So the idea is, um, we're gonna, so think about, again, these two algorithms, starting with random strategies. They're going to be trained, okay? At the end of the training process, we allow them to play, to play according to the learned strategies, okay? Now, what this means is that, um, as I told you, you know, um, they're going to be charging. So here you have two, the two algorithms, the red and the, and, the, and the blue one. And as I told you, they start charging um, prices which are above the competitive level and below, slightly below the monopoly levels, right? So this is what I showed you so far. Then, in this experiment, Emilio steps in overrides the choice of agent one, literally, you know, overriding its choice, and I'm setting a lower price. Then, you know, I switch back on both algorithms and I see what happens in the period after this price went down. This is called a defection, okay? Now, what happens is that um, firm two, of course, was caught by surprise here, right? So here, Basically, I'll show you profits in a second, but I can show you this immediately. What happens is that the profits of firm one go up because it's stealing business from firm two, and the profit of and firm two takes a bloodbath. Okay, so firm two is now much more expensive than its rival, so it's going to take a bloodbath. In the period after that, firm two is going to observe the deviation. Now it's going to react, right? And so what happens is that firm two is going to considerably lower its price, okay? That happens in, you know, on average in all those sessions. Now, it's even more interesting the fact that firm one is lowering its price, okay? Now, one way of interpreting what's going on here is that firm one is lowering its price after its own defection because it's expecting firm two to engage in a price war. And if I expect my rival to engage in a price war, I engage in a price war, right? So the prices go down, and then they sort of slowly recover to the pre-deviation um, level, okay? This is like a signature, or if you want, a hallmark of collusion. Okay, I could show you that the extra profit that you make here by deviating is lower than this bloodbath here. Okay, so if you ask the question, was it a good idea for Emilio to override the machine? The answer is definitely not because here's what happened to profit. So for one period he was ahead, made extra money, but then he took this bloodbath. Okay, so in jargon, basically, we say that here charging high prices is incentive compatible, okay? You charge high prices because these strategies makes it unprofitable to do anything else, right? Um, okay, so, you know, we, we, we make that point, um, so, the, you know, the, the, um, that's just an example, and so the challenge is to show, you know, other ways of systematizing that result. Um, and uh, yeah, so maybe I should skip this uh, in the interest of time and um, tell you what, yeah, what we've been working on, of course, is you know, to increase the complexity of this. That's just a, you know, the, a simple example to understand the learning process uh, and, and, and um, to think about meta games in which those hyperparameters are chosen in a strategic way. Okay, so that leaves me 10 minutes to tell you, right? So I have 10 more minutes, so the idea is to spend it to talk a little bit about the legal doctrine around this. Um, uh, so again, as I, mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, the current doctrine is rooted in conspiracy. So the idea is that, you know, in the US, you can go to jail if you try to jack up prices in a similar way, only if you're basically conspired 
to raise prices. What does that mean? It means that you know, there should be evidence. So the evidentiary standards are such that there should be evidence that indeed there was a mutual intent to raise those prices. Okay? Tacit collusion, which is this idea that I think that you think and you think that I think, and then we figure out independently without talking to each other a way to increase those prices is perfectly legal. Okay? And the reason why it's perfectly legal is because tacit collusion, again, I think that you think and you think that I think and so on and so forth, and we, you know, we end up there, it's considered a chimera. So something which is illusory and hard to achieve. So this is a very hard coordination problem, and you know the, the in most jurisdictions it's thought that it's basically impossible to coordinate on these strategies without actually talking. So the idea is that if you cannot find hard evidence, then there is no there is no tacit collusion. So, but what this means is that what you 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 know what you see is perfectly legal, right? Because here every firm just instructed an algorithm to increase to maximize its own profits then the algorithm ended up without communicating with one another you know implementing suboptimal outcomes and then that would be uh, perfectly illegal and so there is kind of a debate on what do we do about this okay and there are many possible you know many ideas around you know out there on how to approach this of course i mean this is kind of a um, an helicopter view if you want um, if you think that the risk is low so what I, sh I showed you that collusion is possible but then the, you know, next, the next question would be is it probable okay so Emilio right you showed us that in your synthetic marketplace whatever this can happen but then th will this happen on on an actual marketplace because that's much more complex and then you know, what are the chances that they, that they actually learn to do that? So if that risk is low, then, you know, just forget about it. If that risk is high, then you might uh, want to use regulation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. If instead the risk is moderate, then you can use antitrust law. So you could, uh, you could sort of monitor police markets, you know, try to find markers of malfunctionings, and then, you know, intervene on those markets by opening investigations and, and inspect what's going on ex post. Of course, you know, the point is that, you know, if the, 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 the basic point is that if you intervene after tacit collusion realizes, then harm, substantial harm, would have been already made to consumers who have been paying those high prices in the past, right? So you want the risk to be sufficiently low, because if it's high, then you move uh, to regulation. And then the last thing that you could do, this is basically also what has been floated around to fix financial markets, is to think about changes in the architecture of those markets that makes it more difficult for these algorithms to collude, to sort of converge towards the optimal outcome. Okay? Um, on the regulation front, um, yeah, so, yeah. A nice, you know, I like to make this analogy to those who tell me, you know, it's how would you do that? You know, how can you regulate algorithmic design in a way that actually works? These are complex objects, you know, these are highly innovative objects, so it's just going to chill innovation in the industry, it's just going to be completely impractical. But then again, regulation makes sense if you think that the risk of this happening is high, right? So let's assume that the risk is high. Well, we know at least another instance of complex, innovative products, right, that are heavily regulated because the risk is high, right? So that's the FDA is, is, is making complex RCTs, clinical trials, before marketing drugs, because of course, you know, if something goes wrong, people's skin is in the game, right? So people might die, that's a high risk, we might want to take some time to test these drugs in controlled and synthetic experiments and see you know, if that's uh, safe enough to you know, be brought to the marketplace. Um, you, know, you, you, could, you could perfectly draw an analogy uh, by thinking about a federal digital agency that you know, is going to approve algorithms, meaning that the effects have been reviewed, so for this particular algorithm, and then 
the benefit, you know, we decided that the benefits of deploying, you know, pricing algorithms of this particular class on Amazon.com are more than the potential costs that might arise, right? So sandboxing is like uh, something that's been uh, discussed a lot. Europe is, is ahead in a sense that we've been discussing more about regulating digital markets in general. And so there are many proposals on how to intervene in, or, you know, Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. What? It, what? Yeah. I... So can you say that again? Well, there are out there. There's use of algorithms in health mm -hmm. disease scams. Right. Yes. Right, so not that I know in the sense that my understanding of how they work is that um, they're still supervised. So you can use it as a tool to help a physician to make a diagnosis, but you cannot delegate. Yeah, um, but yes. Um, so those are in sense regulated. In a sense, but it's not strict. Right. Right. Now I'll stop here. Maybe we can have a discussion, and you tell me when to stop. Fascinating talk. Can why can't the algorithm reach the monopoly price? Oh, What's they, the main reason they can't actually achieve the monopoly price? Yeah, that's actually a good, why don't they nail it exactly? So um, this is a noisy environment. So this is, you know, the idea is that, you know, one way of thinking about it is that your rival is choosing the right action, but with a sh uh, shaking hand. Okay, so the shaking hand is the exploration. So from time to time, it will make mistakes. Okay. And so I think this noise that it's needed for learning, it's also what's preventing them from uh, nailing it, if you want. And, and have you looked at the experiments that would show you what's the, uh, the distribution of the percentage away from the monopoly price and what well, it depends on? The distribution of the percentage of what? Sorry. So the, the optimal price in collusion that they usually reach. Right. which is away from monopoly price. What's the percentage away from the monopoly price? What's the distribution of that? Um, I showed a distribution. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, so I showed a distribution. Yeah, so I the distribution of prices for a particular session, okay? So that, that was actually, uh, um, is that what you have in mind? I remember there was a diagonal block, but I right. didn't see the distribution. Well, it was a heat map. So the idea is that, yeah, that was a PDF. And, and so is there like some kind of theoretical limit that could be expressed in terms of the noise of information? Yeah. Is it like a, yeah, that's a good question. So I'm trying to, the, the way I'm trying to address that question right now, so I have a project um, with, a, with a bunch of economists and computer scientists, which is trying to show in a simple but analogous sort of context, which is the vision of the lemma, that these algorithms are bound in theory to learn to cooperate in the vision of the lemma. In the vision of the lemma, for those of you who are familiar with, with, that, uh, with that, that strategic setting, cooperation means, so collusion, if you want, means um, being clicked. So the idea is I cooperate as long as my level is cooperating and I detect otherwise. And so the idea is to show that if you have two agents repeatedly playing these games powered by this particular class, well, tell you under which conditions of the primitives of this, you're bound to get uh, this position. 
I think it is would be interesting to see the results of your research. Um, and the last question is not about paper. Like, what do, you, do you see this type of objects actually operate in crypto trading environment? Is that apply to crypto trading environment? Well, do you think they might be operating in, in crypto environment? Yeah, and I've been speaking to central banks, and, and they think so. Okay. And but they also think that they operate in in, 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 in various markets. So at some point, I had an interesting conversation with a team uh, from the Bank of England about the forex, um, because you have these big firms, uh, you know, basically making those markets, their market makers, and providing liquidity. That you could think of being basically their oligopolies that could, you know, potentially collude by maybe taking burns or, you know, they could collude in various ways and they, they were definitely seeing that. that those strategies were automated because they see, you know, if you see the prices changing every millisecond, you know that, you know, this is a computer doing it and they were thinking about, you know, applying some of these tools to show what that would do for high frequency trading markets, so for sure. But this said, if you tell me, you know, is there like an open investigation or a public document that actually um, did something about it or systematically documented this kind of behavior in, in, in one of those markets? Uh, you know, where, so. Yeah. Right, right. So she's, I mean, the message here is not to, that we have problems like this in our marketplaces. The message is that these things can happen, which is moving sort of the goalpost. But the next question, again, is how probable is, you know, for those things to happen? And, you know, maybe in those particular contexts, it's, you know, um, not. I don't know, to be honest with you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much.